Hi, this is Brian Forster of HiddenIncaTours.com and today we're exploring the Giza Plateau. As documented in my new book, Lost Ancient Technology of Egypt, Volume 2. Now this is what is called the Valley Temple, that's its common name. And you can notice that it's limestone that is excessively weathered and eroded. The external surface has been removed over the course of time to be recycled for other structures, likely in the city of Cairo. But the amount of weathering involved is extremely interesting. And here is a section of the outer wall of granite that is still in situ. Now geologists have told me that the amount of weathering on the limestone surfaces above is far more than one would expect from wind and rain and sand and sun over the course of say 2,000 years. Luckily this section that you saw there of the outer granite core is still in place. But here you're looking at megalithic sized stones obviously. The granite outer facing was brought from most likely the Aswan quarry which is about 500 uh, miles to the south, or 800 kilometers. And you're looking at serious tonnage here. And all of these stones interlock, or originally interlocked very beautifully without any mortar whatsoever involved. And again, here we are walking along, and this is what's called the Sphinx Temple in front of the Sphinx. And in fact, the Valley Temple and the Sphinx Temple were originally the same structure. And here again are some of the granite outer facing blocks that um, are still somewhat intact. There you see the Great Pyramid in the background. And again, you're looking at serious tonnage here in terms of the limestone core. Uh, blocks weighing 10, 20, perhaps 40 tons. The weathering is extreme, and we believe that this structure is contemporary with the structure of the Sphinx, meaning that it is 12,000 plus years old, and this is based on what geologists, more than 200 from around the world, tell us, based upon the weathering patterns. So this is inside the so-called Valley Temple. Notice the amount of erosion on the bottom of this pillar as compared to higher up, which we will see in other video clips. You can see the bottom half, roughly, seems to be heavily weathered. That may very well have been water. And here you see the interfacing granite stones that originally were very tightly fitting together. Again, the granite all came most likely from the Aswan Quarry in Aswan itself, in the very southern part of Egypt. Again, notice the weathering on the lower section. And here, again, we're still inside the Valley Temple. You see how the blocks interlock almost perfectly. There was no mortar originally, but they've done repair work, and so they've done some filling in in recent times. And this is the passageway that takes us up higher onto the Giza Plateau. Again, megalithic sized blocks of granite. And geologists have told us that the amount of weathering here is much more excessive than would be under normal conditions over the course of, say, 2,000 years. So once we're outside, there's the second pyramid on the left, and of course the Great Sphinx. And we're going, uh, going to go into some detail as regards the weathering patterns on the Sphinx. But this is a walk back around the outside of the Valley Temple. Again, the exposed limestone surfaces, some of the external granite that was covering the outside and the inside.
and another glimpse inside the niche of the valley temple so that we can see the scale of the granite blocks. There you see a repair that could have been done maybe in dynastic times. The floor is granite and the walls are again these multi-ton blocks. So we go back outside and then turn to the left to have a look at the exterior of the Valley Temple that basically interlocks with what's called the Sphinx Temple. So they were originally one homogeneous structure. Now these massive limestone blocks were taken out of what's called the Sphinx enclosure. So whoever made the Sphinx cut out these multi-ton blocks in order to shape the Sphinx enclosure and shape the Sphinx itself. Each block was taken out, of course, individually and then locked into the one that had been taken out prior. And these vertical weathering lines are the indications of precipitation and precipitation on such a scale has not been seen in this part of Egypt, geologists tell us, for at least 12,000 years. The head, of course, has been recarved during dynastic times, but you see the chest of the Sphinx heavily eroded, and there with the paws we see a lot of reconstruction that likely began during the time of Khufu. Now this shows the difference between the bedrock and here blocks in between the front paws of the Sphinx. And then this wooden walkway which is in between the front paws. And again, a lot of reconstruction has been done to the Sphinx over the course of possibly 4,500 years. You can see relatively modern rebuilding and then much older. And then the bedrock itself. But you see that this is one of the back paws and it clearly has been reconstructed in relatively recent times as compared to the weathering of the Sphinx enclosure. Again, major emphasis on the vertical weathering because that indicates precipitation. And if you didn't know, there is an entrance near the very back end of the Sphinx. There is a ladder inside. So there could be a labyrinth of shafts and tunnels under the Sphinx and the entire Giza Plateau. Once again, the vertical water weathering, and the excessive and extreme erosion that we find at the Sphinx. Different layers are different hardnesses, so the softer layers were carved out much more rapidly than the harder layers. You see the undula undulating lines. And this shows you the extent of the Sphinx enclosure itself, that the Sphinx was carved out of the bedrock itself. And there are the blocks taken from the Sphinx enclosure to build the Sphinx and Valley temples. So once again on the left, you see that's bedrock. On the right, those are blocks. So the story that there is an entrance to the Sphinx in the front is likely true because if you look at the rectangular system of boards there, that section can actually be taken out. And so it's believed that the Egyptologists have discovered the underground tunnel and shaft systems that exist under the Sphinx itself, extending likely all the way at least to the Great Pyramid, if not beyond. On the left you saw that bit of repair and this strange channel, which is really quite rough, but I never noticed this on previous trips. There's a channel that basically goes all the way around the Sphinx, whether it was done 
during dynastic times or not is unknown. It's not very sophisticated. But just to emphasize one more time, the vertical weathering was precipitation. And it has not rained much around the Giza Plateau. Climatologists also tell us for at least 10, if not 12,000 plus years, making the Sphinx at least twice as old as the dynastic Egyptians. And there again is the entrance to a shaft with a metal ladder inside. Uh, of course, it's illegal to go in there, but I filmed it so you could see. And more or less finally, once again, the extreme weathering marks on the limestone of the bedrock of the Sphinx enclosure, all of the repair work that's been done over the Sphinx over the course of up to 4,500 years. Some Egyptologists insist that Khufu was the one who constructed the Sphinx, but it's likely he and Khafre were the ones who did repairs. And this shows you again the transition between the bedrock and then these blocks of limestone and the rectangular section, which underneath is believed to be the entrance to the shaft and tunnel systems.